when we are looking at the vast majority of vertebrates on earth, one of the questions popping out in your mind is why they all look so different because evolution, duh. But what is evolution? Evolution is a gradual, small change in heritable traits over time. I have a question. If I say go work out and suddenly become all nice and sexy, does that mean when I have a baby, it's going to be nice and sexy too? Mm, no, that's not how evolution works. Remember the key word is heritable traits. You going to the gym, working out and being all sexy, there's no way for you to pass that on to your baby. Why is there even a need to evolve or change? Everything else around us is changing. Weather, seasons, climate, plate tectonics, and a bunch of other things happening on earth. If we as living organisms do not adapt to the local conditions of the environment, we will die. How exactly do local environmental conditions bring about changes in organisms? Say we have a population of squirrels that used to sprawl over this vast expanse of land. For some reason, that patch of land dries up and there are only a few places where there are trees that produce the food that these squirrels eat. They split off into two groups following the vegetation where the food source is. At some point, the population just develops a certain mutation. They develop a coat color that's slightly darker so that they can blend in much better. If you take a member of that population and a member of this other population, bring them together, they might be like, whoa, who are you? So they don't interbreed. That pressure to change now gives you two different morphologies. So from one becomes two, so more diverse. Aside from being isolated based on the actual geography or the physical environment, you can also be isolated based on the preference of your mates. You know what I mean? This widow bird right here, this is the male of the species. And you must be wondering why the long ass tail feathers? For some reason, the chicks dig the long tails. They like the guys with a long one. Not those long ones, because they only choose to mate with the guys with the long tail feathers, then that's the gene that kind of gets passed on to the next generation of males. Maybe this other population of birds where the females prefer the short tailed birds, they go do their own thing and they have another group of birds with the short tails. Before you know it, they barely recognize each other again and they don't even want to make babies and they diverge until tada, two different species. From a single population, of an ancestral species that gives rise to a bunch of descendants that end up being different species. These are what we call speciation events. If you repeat these events over the course of billions of years, you end up with a staggering amount of biodiversity that will surely Jumanji the shit out of any house. How do we clean up this mess? How do we make sense of all this diversity? For most of us, we would probably classify and sort these organisms based on how closely they resemble each other. And we do that just by, by looking like, oh, you look like this. So you go with the other guys that look like this. While this is indeed a useful way to group organisms, morphology based classification can sometimes lead to a few false assumptions. If they look similar, then they're probably closely related, right? If they look different, then they're probably not related at all. Now, why do we end up with such a problem in the first place? Because morphological features can be similar in different ways. It's weird, right? Yes, they're similar in different ways. When we sort things in the most common sense manner, which is just based on morphology, Usually we are looking at either analogous structures or homoplastic structures or homoplasious structures, whichever one. Analogous structures are structures that fulfill the same functions. What about homoplasious or homoplastic structures? These are structures that just look the same. The tricky part is this part, homology. It's like, how do you know that these structures come from the same ancestor because that kind of completes the picture of who's related to whom. Another thing to note is that homology, analogy, and homoplasy 
are not mutually exclusive. So there are some structures that are both analogous and homoplastic. That means they look the same and they function the same. Could be homologous and analogous, homologous and homoplastic, or a combination of all three. If, say, we have these three animals, and all we had are our senses and the wits to pick out the least related among the three. Who is the odd one out? See if you can figure out which structures are analogous. If you answered the tail fin of the whale shark and the fluke of the blue whale, then congratulations. Yes, those are analogous structures. They have the same function. Which structures are homoplastic or homoplasious. If you answer the pectoral fins of the whale shark and the forelimbs of the whale or the flippers of the whale, then yes, those are homoplasious structures. They look the same. Now, finally, which structures are homologous? Ah! Well, like, how would I know which structures arose from a common ancestor? For that, we need to consider evolutionary history or phylogeny. To save us time, I will swing you over to Minute Earth so you can watch their short video on what we are about to get to. Hit pause, click the video link in the description, or I'll just leave it somewhere here. And then after watching the video, go ahead and visit the website which they use to construct their phylogenetic tree. Yes, you gotta watch the video so you know where to go. And then use that same website to figure out which of these animals is the odd one out. After that, <laughs> you think that's done? No, you will add these animals to the tree just for kicks and see what you come up with. I'll see you in a few minutes. Congratulations. I think it was pretty obvious that it was a What, why are you bleeping that? I was just about to say that the was the odd one out. What we ended up with a family tree that would probably appear different had we sorted this bunch based on morphology alone. This leaves us with a totally new set of questions. Why aren't the whale shark and the whale close relatives? And why did they end up looking so similar? They evolved similar looking structures independently because they were faced with the same environmental challenges. They just happened to be at the same place even though they weren't really related. It happens a lot more often than we think. If this happens in distant re related species, such as your whale, shark, and your whale, we call this convergent evolution. But if it happens in more closely related species, it's parallel evolution. Many homoplasious and analogous structures actually come about in this manner. Why are the whale and the elephant, and if you did the other animals in the list, Surprisingly, the cow, <laughs> the cow and the whale, what the fuck, right? Why are they very close relatives despite looking vastly different? Their ancestors were actually terrestrial, but for some reason, they just ended back in the water, maybe because there were less predators, less competition, more food in the water. And because I don't know the details, perhaps this is when you start slipping into the rabbit hole of phylogenetic detective work. Because let's face it, it's kind of fun and interesting to piece together information from morphology and then the DNA evidence and then geologic evidence, what actually happened in the Earth's history through fossil records, carbon dating. You put all of that together for a bunch of these different animals. And finally, you end up with a tree that kind of looks like this, which is now the tree of life as we know it, more or less. But for this subject, don't worry, we're not going to look into all of these. We're just going to look at... Oh crap, which way do I go? We are just going to look at this part of the tree, just the vertebrates, which we're going to start with fish all the way to the more complex mammals. But what is the point of knowing all of this anyway? Like any good story, you have to start from the beginning. And in the history of life on Earth, humans kind of appeared somewhere in the middle. And the story is still writing itself today. But who cares? Who cares if we know about our past? We can actually survive without really knowing what happened in the Earth's history. It doesn't help pay the bills. It doesn't help get you that house and lot that you've been saving up for doesn't even put food on the table or get you even anything related to your online shopping wish list. 
if there's at least one thing you can remember from this course in the context of vertebrate morphology or just even life on Earth, it's all about form and function. All life, whether in the past, present, or future, was, is, and will be shaped by our ever-changing universe. All of the history of Earth is etched into our very bodies. That's the cool thing. Moving forward, what form are we going to talk about? Specifically, the chordate form. We're first just going to have a quick introduction on chordates as a group. And for that, again, I'm going to leave a few more videos for you to watch right here. I don't need to make a new video because it's kind of all there anyway. You can watch those instead and I'll see you soon.